presentation will be moderated by Dr. Ma Michael Berzer. Dr. Berzer is a professor in the School of Criminal Justice at Wichita State University, where he is also a leadership fellow. He specializes in the study of policing. He was the 2017 recipient of the Wichita State President's Virtue Venture Award for his proposal to bring the Wichita Cedric County Law Enforcement Training Center to campus where it sits today. He is also the 2021 recipient of the Wichita State's Excellence in, in Community Research Award. He has published 12 books on policing and or criminal justice and over 75 scholarly journal articles and research technical reports. Governor Laura Kelly recently appointed Dr. Berzer to the Kansas State Board of Indigent Defense Services. He also serves as vice chair of the Sedgwick County Community Corrections Advisory Board. Prior to entering academia, he served in the law enforcement, retiring at the rank of Lieutenant. We also have two more panelists. For the last 26 years, Gwendolyn Grant has been the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Kansas City. She's the first female CEO in the organization's 100 plus year history. She is also involved in the Missouri Coordinating Board for Higher Education and Workforce Development. And she recently founded the COVID-19 Collective Impact Collaborative. She has received several accolades and is a member of the National Urban League's Executive Academy of Fellows. Gordon Ramsey has been Chief of Police for the Wichita Police Department for five years. He previously served as the Chief of Police of Duluth, Minnesota from 2006 to 2016. While serving as Wichita's Chief of Police, he has actively worked at building stronger relationships with the community by establishing a civilian review board and community liaison officers for underserved groups. By in 1920, in 2020, <laughs> he was appointed to the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice. And now we'll turn the program over to Dr. Berzer. Okay, thank you, Megan. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having us uh, with you today to talk about this um, very, very important issue. And in my, you know, many years of either practicing or studying uh, policing, this is probably the, the worst or the worst state of flux I have ever seen the profession in. And, you know, we talk about reform so often over the years. In fact, as you mentioned, Chief Ramsey was just um, uh, set on the last commission to study policing reform and criminal justice reform. And then a few years before that, we had another, um, you know, police reform commission, a presidential commission formed to study the state of policing. But, you know, we've done this throughout the years. You'd have to go back to 1931 for the first time it's ever been studied. And that was with the Wickersham report. And they did the same thing is study the state of policing and criminal justice. So what I thought I'd do today to get right into this is I've prepared a few questions to kind of stimulate discussion uh, with um, Chief Ramsey and uh, Gwen Grant. And uh, maybe we can get a, a conversation going. And then towards the end, I take it, we'll try to wrap up a few minutes earlier in the event we do have some questions. So with that, let me open it up with uh, Chief Ramsey. Um, you know, Chief, the last few years, we've heard a lot about what's wrong with policing. Uh, many think that, you know, the state of policing is a broken system right now beyond repair. Can you give us some thoughts on your perspective as a, as a large city police agency, as a chief in large city agency? Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and uh, I think this is where we really make progress is when we have these community discussions. And it's been exacerbated by COVID where we haven't been able to get together. So it's, it's, it's great to uh, see everybody on the call today. For me, there is no industry or profession where there isn't some need for improvement, right? In policing, I think particularly in the last year, we've had some horrible cases that have highlighted the need, certain areas that we need to improve uh, and we need to continue to fix. I don't think it's broken, but I do think there are several areas that we really need to improve upon. Okay, very good, Chief. Chief, can you, just to follow up on that, how do you see the you know, reimagining of policing in this country? How do, you, how do you envision that? Well, one of the places that police find themselves today is there's an over-reliance on police for all the social issues, right? Mental health, chemical dependency, uh, homelessness, uh, 
all these issues really are falling on the backs of the police department. And it is because of disinvestment in our communities. Um, we look at our poorest neighborhoods and there's less resources there than there has been in decades, uh, I believe. And that is what's feeding into a lot of these issues. We really need to look at reinvesting back in our communities and looking at how resources, how many resources we have in our communities and, and what more we can do to prevent a lot of the reasons that police are having contact with uh, you know, our community, such as mental health, um, a lot of the issues around youth violence are just a couple. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you 110% chief on, on your assessment. The other thing I just mentioned, um, the new COVID bill that's about to get passed has $1 billion appropriated to go to crisis intervention teams to work with police agencies. And I think that is a good thing. So now you will have mobile crisis intervention teams, which you know a few years ago risk didn't exist to the extent that this bill will allow them to. So uh, that's some good news. Uh, with that, let me, um, let me move on to Gwen Grant. And she has done some significant work in, as the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Kansas City. But Gwen, from the broader African-American community perspective, what kinds of police reforms do you hear are needed? Well, I'll speak first on uh, needed reforms at the federal level. Uh, we want to see the passage of the George Floyd Pol uh, Justice and Policing Act, which is, has been passed twice in the, in the House and has failed to pass the Senate. Uh, this, uh, this particular piece of legislation would ban chokeholds, it would ban no-knock warrants in drug cases, uh, it would reform uh, qualified immunity, which would make it easier to pursue uh, claims against police officers in, in uh, civil court and a number of other uh, much needed reforms that I think set the stage for addressing uh, policing overall. That's at a national level. On the local level, uh, we are pressing for policies that are uh, clear, uh, that speak to transparency and accountability uh, for uh, police departments that speak to uh, equal justice. Um, you know, we really support what we call procedural justice in policing, where we have fairness and processes that, uh, that we have transparency, that we have an opportunity for community to have voice and that uh, we have impartiality in decision-making, which is, right now what does not seem to be the basic uh, methods of policing, certainly in the, in the Kansas City area. Uh, what we have is basically uh, our police department investigating uh, itself with, re with respect to uh, community complaints against officers for excessive force and other, other uh, issues. Uh, we have a department that only reaches and, and, and just started doing this because of community pushback in cases of deadly force with law enforcement. Uh, they now seek outside uh, investigations, but here just several months ago, in the past uh, several months, our police department investigates itself. That does not lend itself to uh, certainly transparency. We expect that officers who are accused or who are, have been indicted for excessive force uh, receive the same type, you know, equal justice in the law. And so I could go on and on, I'll stop here, but we have a long list of policy recommendations that we believe will impact or will generate uh, more of a community police relationship that can be productive uh, and that will build bridges of respect that, uh, that bridges are so necessary uh, to addressing meaningful, authentic uh, reform in policing. Thank you for that, Gwen. I, I think there's a couple of themes there that I pick out. Number one is the community the community involvement in that process. That's something in my you know, years of studying this issue, the intersection of policing and particularly race is that that's one thing that citizens uh, think they lack is a voice at the table when decisions are being made. So I, I do think that's very important. And I think that's beginning to change across the country, uh, allowing more uh, citizens to have that voice, to be at the table. And uh, 
so yeah, great point. The other point I'll just make on procedural justice, as Chief Ramsey knows, that is recommended in all of the reform reports that I've read. Uh, the elements are, are implementing some of those into policing operations. So I think that's a good move as well. Let me, uh, with that, let me just kind of throw this question out, either Wynn or Chief. Um, there has been a lot of talk about defunding the police. And of course, when you look at that, that's a hot button issue and it means different things to different people. How do you conceptualize defunding the police? What's it mean to both of you? Gwen, if you wanna tackle that one first. I, think I, I just spoke, I think I will uh, yield to Chief Ramsey to go first. Well, for me, I get the, the idea and philosophy behind defunding, right? It's hurtful for me as a police chief to see where we are today, where people think that uh, police are more hurtful than harmful. And obviously some of the national events have, have led down that road. So for me, it is really what I mentioned earlier about the disinvestment in our neighborhoods, the disinvestment in social services, lack of mental health treatment. If someone came to me and said, Gordon, I'm a meth addict and I'm out committing burglaries to feed my habit, and I'd, I'd like to get out of it and I'd like treatment, it would take us about six months to get that person in treatment, right? That the systems are broken. Um, for mental health, there just isn't the resources out there. And unfortunately, 911 is that three digit government number where you can call 24 seven at 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. and get a government agent out to your house to help. And so that's this over-reliance on the police to deal with all these societal issues. And I think defunding is one of the concepts behind it is that we need to fund other services so that police don't have to be the ones that are always responding. And, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. You know, we, we're working on embedding social workers. We have DCF caseworkers. Believe it or not, we get 911 calls frequently of people saying, my nine-year-old's not going to school. Can you send an officer over? That is not what police should be doing. So we have partnered with DCF. They fund two positions that help that, you know, these calls that come into 911 where we divert them to these caseworkers. I went to one of our police stations recently and there was uh, clothes and socks and bedding and mattresses. And I'm like, I thought someone was storing their stuff there. And then I realized, you know what, this is the reimagined police department. This is where our social workers are st storing their items to help families in need and partnering with the police department on doing that. So really, I think at the crux of it is this need for more resources in our society and particularly in our poor and lower income neighborhoods. Very good, I, I agree with you, Chief. I've just recently, I have drove around to some of our, what we call uh, qualified opportunity zones in Wichita. And some of the things that I saw were just, you know, how, how can we allow this to happen? And these are structural things I believe that have taken the course over over time in this community, and they've never been addressed, and that that has saddened uh, saddened me tremendously to see some of those conditions. Um, the other thing I would just mention is that uh, you know some of the reform movement uh, that I've seen across the country, uh, a big issue with those is you know the high discretionary stops that officers are doing in the field. Many agencies now are starting to restrict those to a certain extent. And I consider that, uh, you know, the pretextual stops, basically. Um, some jurisdictions um, have really limited to those now unless they're absolutely necessary because what they have found is that is probably sparked more controversy or more conflict between the police and the community. And we know where the majority of those stops primarily take place, they're in communities of color. So just a, a quick follow-up on that, if you wanna, Take that, Chief, or, or Gwen. Well, I'd like to first be able to respond to the defunding. You know, I, I yielded to the Chief, but I didn't yield the floor totally. So okay, let's sorry. get back to that. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, when we talk about defunding, uh, we're talking uh, to some, you know, in some aspects, we agree with, with the Chief that certainly we believe that uh, we need to divest uh, for, and I'm speaking from the perspective of Kansas City Police Department, uh, where I am most engaged, but also from a national level in understanding what defund really means. It's a matter, you know, we, we get all caught up in language, 
uh, defund and that sends this message and there's all this pushback about around it. But basically what we're using terminology such as divest and invest or reallocation in our, in our city, we're one of the few or only cities in the nation where we do not have local control of our police department. So Casey, the city council, the city of Kansas City, Missouri, me as a taxpayer, we are paying to fund a police department over which we have no control relative to policies, practices, and procedures. We have a state appointed board that decides uh, what happens with that police department while we are investing to the tune of 270 plus million dollars a year. Uh, and we feel that we're investing in our own oppression for many of us. Uh, and so that is really offensive. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, it's just wrong on a number of levels. So that, then uh, when we talk about, so we are required by state mandate uh, to invest 20% of the city operating fund into law enforcement. 270 plus million dollars far exceeds that, that uh, mandate of 20% of the general fund. So what we're saying is to divest, only invest 20% of the general fund in the police department, and then take those dollars, those millions of dollars, and invest those dollars into our local community to address uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, health issues, rebuilding our inner city to address blight to address crime, real crime prevention measures versus investing into uh, military oversight and over-policing in Black communities. And so that's where we're coming from when we talk about defunding. That's, that's uh, our response to that. And so we, we believe that less policing is required instead of more. We believe that less money should be invested in law enforcement, more money should be invested in community development, economic development, housing, building strong education programs in inner cities. That's, and if we do that, we will have much, uh, you know, we won't need law enforcement in the way that we're using law enforcement today. We also, to your other point, uh, is around de-escalation um, and uh, racial profiling, other policies that we want to see addressed. In the state of Missouri, a person, a, a Black person is 91% more likely to be stopped while driving than their white counterpart. And so, and then, then when we have these encounters with law enforcement, a general, a basic traffic stop for a Black person can end in death. So what we've seen here in Kansas City, we've seen uh, here just recently, uh, we've had cases of what started out to look to look like just a, a, a traffic violation result in deadly force and a, and a black man, unarmed black man being killed after being pulled over by law enforcement. So we need less encounters with law enforcement. For us, it's a life-saving measure. And it's rooted in a system that has been structurally racist since its, its, since its inception. And it, it, and it weighs heavily disproportionately on black lives. So um, I'll stop there and let, let someone else have a response. And, uh, you know, I, I will say, uh, you know, Kansas City, Missouri is 70, 60,000 people more than Wichita and their police department, I think is two to three times our size. Um, for, for us here, I, we are a very lean department. And I would say we border already on being defunded. We just don't have the numbers that many of our larger cities have. Uh, I do believe that there is a need for more money to go to these other uh, needs. And if we can lower our crime and get some of these issues down, um, I think you know maybe someday that could happen um, in cities like Wichita where that money can go for other needs. But right now we already do not get to investigate the cases that people want us to. We get regular complaints about people that are victims of crimes and say, hey, you guys aren't doing anything with this. And it's simply because we don't have the resources to do it. Now, on the traffic stop question, um, when I got to Wichita in 2016, and one of the big issues with police, policing, and from my perspective as the chief, is changing culture. And I noticed that we had, had disparities in traffic stops. And we started talking about what is discretion and when do you decide to pull over a vehicle? That conversation had never been had here before I arrived. As a matter of fact, 
the day I had that conversation with a group of supervisors, a news station called me and they said, hey, Gordon, we hear you're telling your cops not to write tickets. And, um, you know, that's an example of the force that comes about when you try to change culture. So we started having a discussion on what do tickets do to a community and what happens when you over police or nitpick. And I remember I had a training officer when I first started and he probably gave me the best advice ever back in 1993. He said, Gordon, he said, don't write chicken s tickets to your community. Don't over police in other words, you know, and that little bit of advice has carried me throughout my policing career is we need to recognize the impact that our actions have. We partnered down here with our urban league to introduce the program of the lights on program where instead of issuing someone a ticket for a light out violation an equipment violation, we give them a coupon to have it repaired at free of expense. And it's programs like that that is going to move policing forward. Partnerships like when we, we partner with the Urban League down here and other community entities and involve them in the police department and help us be better. That's how I think we're going to get improve our relationships. Yeah, I agree, Chief. You mentioned the Lights On program and that, of course, I'm doing your evaluation on that. And what I've seen so far in the data, very promising. Uh, citizens love it. So that's, that's, a, that's a win and that's a, that starts. So, um, Gwen, did you want to dovetail onto anything? We well, on? I, I, I agree that um, the way to build, you know, the pathway to building community trust and collaboration with law enforcement is about uh, developing authentic relationships that are not about control, command and control in, in, in black communities to keep people, you know, in order to, to arrive at order. It's about uh, recognizing that the system, first off, is is uh, that there is no trust because of the abuse uh, that Black people have endured over centuries at the hands of law enforcement. These undeniable uh, events in history have to be acknowledged and addressed. Uh, police departments have to demonstrate that they value and respect the humanity of Black people. And when you are over-policing, when you are stopping people and, you know, for petty things and, and, and exercising officer discretion uh, with you know, inequitable uh, responses, because typically uh, the, the outcome of uh, a traffic stop with a Black person is, is oftentimes uh, not the same as a traffic stop with a white person. And that's evidenced by data of what is happening uh, across this country. Even in the aftermath of George Floyd and the conviction of Derek Chauvin, in just this same week, we have seen law enforcement officers across this country still respond with deadly force in incidents with Black people that should never have escalated to that level. And so we, it's to build trust when we are, uh, is to respect our lived, our history and our daily experiences. And, and a, the leadership and a police department really matters. And based on what I'm hearing from you, Chief Ramsey, is that you're, exact, you're absolutely right. The, the culture within your organization is set by you. You are accountable for that. And so when you say to your officers, we will not be pulling people over and doing this, we will treat people with dignity and respect and we must respect the humanity of all of our citizens, then that sets the tone. I wish you could pass some of that leadership style to Kansas City because that's not where we're getting here. I will say that. Yeah, thank, thank you, Gwen. I, I agree with that as well. I think you know, particularly when we look at traffic stops, that is the area that uh, probably most people, the only contact they'll have with the police are through a traffic stop. And oftentimes that's only once or twice, but usually in communities of color, that is not the case. Uh, those could be multiple. And, uh, you know, it's, it's driven by the pretext, which is driven by a lot of different factors. Uh, you know, the drug war is a big one of those. Uh, the other thing, um, I was just going to point out when we talk about, um, you know, when I talk to my students in class or whether I find myself teaching a group of police officers on 
racial profiling. I always tell the Caucasian officers, I say, you know, when you stop an African-American, particularly an African-American male, it may just be a car stop to you, but to that African-American male, there's a whole history and there's a whole structure behind that stop. So that's something you have to keep in mind as you get and begin to practice procedural justice techniques, which I think uh, can go a long way. So um, let me, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, I thought, thought someone had a reply. Let me, let me move on. Chief, you mentioned about uh, the culture, changing the culture of the police organization. And um, that I suppose would start in the academy. And I was just gonna ask you, how do you envision the new officer or the, the, office, the ideal officer that you would like to see setting in the academy classroom? What would he or she look like? Well, this is what we've been working on, Professor. And really, you know, when you look at uh, how we recruit, um, we what we send out are signals throughout our community, like a lighthouse that sends its beam around, right? What we want is we. I like second career candidates, someone with life experience, uh, someone who's maybe been in social worker or another profession that maybe has had children, um, not a 20, 20 year old. I was 20 when I got into policing, I was way too young. I didn't have the life experience or the maturity. Um, I'll tell you what, we've, been, uh, we've built a dream team recruiting group that is recruiting some of the most fantastic people ever. I interviewed four candidates yesterday. They all had their degree, they all had a four year degree. I think that is critical for policing. We know, as you know, Professor, research shows that an officer who has a four-year degree is better communication, more empathy, better understanding of some of the big world pictures. So a degree is very important. That life experience is important. But also uh, someone who has faced adversity. You know, a lot of our, when, again, culture has played a big part of this uh, recruiting issue is that what I found was our recruiting numbers were extremely low when I got here. We were getting candidates that uh, you know really didn't have the diversity that we looked for. So we have refocused and doubled down on trying to represent more of what our community looks like. And it starts by changing barriers. You know, we changed some rules around um, you know, drugs, uh, for instance, marijuana usage, right? It's legal in Colorado. But yet if you had used marijuana, uh, you were banned from getting on the police department if you had used it, I think within longer than uh, 10 years, right? So we've changed that, we've uh, lowered those uh, issues. We've also allowed for uh, different kinds of hairstyles, uh, women to have painted nails, um, you know, just things to make us more inclusive and understanding of different cultures and it's paying off. We've had our most diverse recruit classes uh, in the department history. We've got more women joining the department than ever before, but it's changing some of those issues that had been barriers before. One of the big things when I got here was we were using a physical fitness program that had been, um, there had been a lawsuit in another city on the same uh, standards that they had to reach to pass, but it was biased against women. Their upper body strength wasn't strong enough. So we weren't seeing the women uh, applicants pass that physical fitness. And you, know, you can go through this list of things that historically the, the departments have done that weed out some of the very people that we wanna bring in. And we've changed those rules. And we're, as a result, we're seeing significant increases in uh, people of color and women joining the department and applying and, and being successful in getting on. Thank you for that, Chief. Just to go back to your comment on the college education, there was just about a year, maybe two years ago, there was a major, a fairly sophisticated study that was released out of, I believe, the University of Massachusetts. They looked at a number of different factors on use of force complaints, and they tracked officers over the course of, uh, it was a longitudinal, kind of a long-term study, and they found the number one predictor of an officer not using force was a college education. Uh, so interesting. And, you know, of course, college education for police, that's something that Again, we go back to 1931 with the Wickersham report, and you know they recommended at least a bachelor's degree for police at that time. And then some of our later reformers recommended the same thing. So we've been hearing that for some time, but of course, um, you know that got into recruiting issues in and of itself, and the types of persons that didn't have access to college at that time, primarily minority candidates, racial minorities. And so if you required that, 
you would have a problem recruiting those racial minorities who didn't have the same economic advantages. So um, the other thing, um, I've noticed some police agencies too across the country are beginning to team up with candidates uh, to assist them in getting expungements of some of those minor things that would otherwise keep them out of police service. And uh, several jurisdictions have done that and have been as successful of that um, across the country. So that's something that's being kind of touted as well as something that might work. Um, let me, um, first of all, Gwen, did you want any, how would, from the community perspective on the ideal police officer, what they would look like? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that the challenge with recruiting uh, to uh, now that many law enforcement um, jurisdictions will face is that the overall image of policing right now is is bad, you know, and it's not uh, every time I turn on the news and, and see another uh, deadly force incident and then to see how how uh, law enforcement responds relative to uh, the community outcry for, for transparency, such as the case is what's happening in North Carolina uh, right now. Uh, those things just don't lend to, uh, hey, I want to sign up for that job. So, <laughs> you know, but basically I would want, you know, the person who was seeking to choose law enforcement as a, as a uh, profession to be someone who's willing to uh, be, to educate him or herself about the history, the real history of America, the real history of this country that is a history that uh, was uh, a country that was born on the backs of slavery and a country where the law, where law enforcement was built out of slave patrols, uh, a country where uh, that is uh, structurally racist. Uh, and if we don't have that understanding, then you come into law enforcement with uh, blurred vision and an inability to see the realities uh, uh, through the lens and through the eyes of black and brown people. And if you don't know that and you come and you have very little uh, you know, knowledge about the communities that you police, then it doesn't matter in my view how much education you have. If that is not a part of that education, you're not totally fully, fully prepared for the, for the job at hand. And so that's all that I would add. I, I think it's important to um, have solid training programs and uh, when you're recruiting and that you're training, but, but frankly, uh, it's hard, you know, people talk about, oh, officers need to have implicit bias training and we need to do more, you know, about uh, diversity and training. Well, these, these trainings typically just are ineffective and don't work. I had a social scientist on a panel uh, here for one of our programs a, a few years ago. And she just said, you know, her research shows that implicit bias training does not work. And everybody's on the implicit bias training bandwagon, but the outcomes have yet to be proven that it's effective. For number one, which for me is like basic common sense, is that it is an implicit bias. It is not an explicit bias. So if I am not cognitively aware that I have this bias, then sitting in training is not going to help me to confront my biases and to address them. I'm just going to sit in training and have the same reaction that most people, especially white people have when they are forced to attend diversity training, anti-racism training, or implicit bias training. They come in, they sit through it, and then they leave and go back to business as usual because they have not taken any personal ownership for their own biases, racism, or bigotry. They will tell you, I am not a racist. I am not a bigot. I have no biases. I don't have a racist bone or a bias bone in my body. Typically when people make those proclamations to me, I, then my assumption is that the opposite is actually the truth. Yeah, I, when I, I agree, particularly with your point on the implicit bias, there's been a lot of work uh, from the research end on implicit bias. And, you know, that's a phenomenon that we begin to hear about not even 10 years ago. Uh, and then we begin to see it, the new kind of the, what I call old wine and new bottles, basically. And um, one of the most sophisticated studies just was released within the last year. And it showed that it was 
ineffective. Uh, and when they track the officers that attended that training over time, uh, I think better ways that we can do to get around that is number one, we begin to again address those highly discretionary car stops. I think is one way to start to eliminate some of that because I believe that's where you're seeing much of that bias is in the car stop. Um, uh, but may I just say something to that? Sure. I, agree with you. I agree with you uh, on that wholeheartedly. And I think getting back to the issue of leadership um, and how do you how do you address so, so many of our challenges come with that encounter at that, that traffic stop, right? And so if you are the police chief or if you are a command uh, officer and you have your officers in patrol, if you are not capturing data, and I think here's a, so now I'm getting down in the weeds of how do you actually execute uh, uh, in, in, in your department to address uh, racial profiling. And what I've asked police chiefs here and have not been able to get an answer, number one, is they don't track data. I mean, so it's hard to give if I don't know that I'm biased and I cannot own that I stop black people at higher frequencies than I stop white people, then somebody's need, someone needs to put some data in front of me that tells me this is what you are doing. You don't, may not realize it, but this is what you're doing. And so now, now you see the numbers. This is how you're disproportionately stopping black people versus white people. Now I'm going to hold you accountable to, as the chief or as a command officer, I'm going to hold you accountable to addressing this behavior. And I don't know, Chief Ramsey, do you have such a process in place that says a way that you can track the stops that your officers are making that you can analyze is this truly uh, a valid stop or you know is there something that can be done in that regard because maybe i'm off base here with this thinking yeah no this is a another example of the importance of partnering i talked about our partnership with the urban league on the lights on um, we have a racial profiling committee down here who is very active and uh, is always pushing me to do more and better and they have analyzed our data and given me many good tips and ways to help. Um, so again, that partnership where you open up your books to community, uh, I found has been helpful. Uh, I, my goal as the chief is to have the community say about our police department that if they see us in their rear view mirror, that they're not worried about getting pulled over, unless of course they've done something wrong. Um, but. Uh, you know, I, I want people to have confidence in us. And I think one of the ways we do that is by working with our different activist groups and those that have concerns about policing. I can tell you early in my career, I took a job in a neighborhood that no one else wanted to work. And it was, uh, you know, predominant minority. And there was a distrust among both sides on the police and in the community. And uh, I ended up, that ended up being my favorite job because I got to know <laughs> just about everybody in my small beat. And I am friends with a lot of those people to this day. I felt more, uh, I had more internal happiness as a result of that. The community felt better about the police. I was safer. I remember one time I was wrestling with uh, a guy I was trying to arrest and community members, members came out to help me. I know that in some cases, in uh, some police, they wouldn't have come out to help. So I was safer. I got more information from them on who was committing what crime. And I made lifelong friends that today, 25, 26 years later, I still communicate with and get invited to weddings and different events. And it was, uh, you know, that is the model for policing. We, we know what the formula is. It's getting the cops out of the car and interacting and creating positive contacts whenever possible and not uh, confrontational, but more there. Why many cops say they get into it to help people and to be, uh, good public servants. Somewhere along the line, though, in policing, we tend to get off and it tends to go down the militaristic uh, do as I say. And, you know, when you when you boil it down, that is where we're at. And that's why it's important for leadership to set the stage and tone for what they expect with their officers. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, too, going back to the uh, how do you prevent some of those uh, biases and the idea that implicit bias may not be the panacea, so to speak. I think 
you know, those highly discretionary, the pretextual stops, we look at those a little bit more. And also, I think frontline sergeants and chief, we talked about this last week, the importance of the frontline supervisor to be able to identify an officer that may potentially have an issue and begin to intervene early on so we don't have something disastrous happen in the future. And of course, you know, there's some fairly, fairly robust uh, ways that you can compare like situated officers um, looking at stop practices and things of that nature. So, but I, I think the, the American police sergeant is one that, you know, has a, such an important role. They are on the front lines and they have daily contact with their officers. Okay, uh, any follow-up, Gwen, from your side? Okay, um, well, let me just ask you this. We kind of hit on this a little bit already, but as you know, uh, some of the recent national polls that have been done have shown that uh, police community relations, particularly in the African-American community, has simply plummeted to new lows. Um, what, from your perspective, uh, or let's just talk from each of our perspectives, what do you think we need to do to begin to repair these relationships that have just been off and on for so many years now in this country's history? Ms. Grant, go ahead. <laughs> oh, wow. So, um, you know, I've, I think it, it, uh, it's a long road to repairing um, and, and to repairing the damage, the historical damage. But I think it, it probably starts with the restorative justice process. That's one aspect of it. And looking at res restorative justice is really about repairing the harm uh, that, you know, has been caused by crime. And so it would require law enforcement to acknowledge the fact that their behavior against black people in America has been and is criminal, uh, that there are criminal elements in the treatment of black people and that the restorative justice approach means that there has to be acknowledgement of that. There has to be then uh, this opportunity where victims, because victims are not just, uh, we're not just talking about black on black crime or uh, white on white crime, any of that, we're talking about addressing uh, this through the lens of, of the offender and the offender can be the police as well as others. Uh, we're uh, address, uh, talking about addressing it through victims and then the community coming together to decide how to repair the damage. And that means to get to that point, then law enforcement has to acknowledge its complicity, its culpability, in these problems. Um, and so I think that's a piece. The other piece that, but how do we even get to that table is that law enforcement has to um, um, hold itself, other police officers accountable. Uh, you can't, you know, turn your back when a law, when a, when a law enforcement officer, um, you know, is a, abusive, uh, in the community, that person needs to be held accountable by law enforcement. We shouldn't have to be out here fighting in the streets and, you know, through advocacy and activism to have to ensure that an officer like Derek Chauvin uh, is held accountable for killing George Floyd or, you know, in many in all of these cases. So it starts there. And as, as we continue to see uh, we, you know, Chauvin gets convicted of killing George Floyd and still officers are, I mean, they're killing black people uh, with, for the most part, with impunity. And so that's, until we get to that place where there is truly equal justice, it's going to be very difficult to get to reconciliation and reparations. Yeah, Gwen, that's a good point. I'm, I'm a real advocate of that restorative uh, justice model. Uh, I've seen that used um, and read some of the literature where that's being used in schools and they've actually been able to take uh, police officers that were assigned to those schools out of the schools and they have teams that have been trained in the restorative justice to address the harms and that might be peer mentoring within the school, it might be a group of teachers, it might be students, but it, it's been proven to be a fairly effective approach. So, you know, 
taking that template and kind of putting that across communities and police, I think it's worth a try. I, I do. Chief Ramsey, do you have any want to dovetail yeah, well, on that? Restorative justice, we are training our officers on restorative justice in partnership with our schools. We have a very good relationship with our public schools. Uh, we only have officers in the high schools, but you know our high schools here are very large and uh, there's a disproportionate amount of victimization and crime that occur in those. They're like little cities, you know, uh, 2000 kids in there and um, we would be called there regardless. Now we are very, very conscientious of the concerns about bringing kids into the criminal justice system. As a matter of fact, last year we started a unit that focuses on grabbing kids that are on the edge or cusp of crime and, and getting them resources and working with their family to keep them out of the criminal justice system. That is our goal is to keep kids out. We do it in partnership with the schools. Uh, we have a different philosophy here as far as that goes. The other thing is anytime anybody, if anybody ever has a concern about a youth that has been uh, put in the criminal justice system for they think that something is not fair, we want to have those conversations. Um, and, you know, I think the future of policing is where you have that community relationships and also an audit model where you have someone auditing your numbers and what's happening in, in your police department with the goal of getting in line with where you should be, right? That auditor model. I would love to have someone come into the police department regularly and look at all, all we do and make recommendations on how we could do, do better. This is, uh, you know, we have 900 employees here and a lot of moving parts. We go on hundreds of thousands of calls a year and have hundreds of thousands of contacts with people. The more data I can get to improve, uh, you know, the better off we'll be. But there's no doubt as far as relationships go that we are at a low point. I think it's been exacerbated, as I said, with COVID and it hasn't helped. But uh, we are pushing our officers to be closer to the community. And one of the big concerns that I have is so the officers feel this too, right? And keep in mind that uh, I got to talk about uh, Wichita uh, on uh, mappingpoliceviolence.com. They did extensive research on where African-Americans uh, have been uh, killed in police contacts. Wichita is one of three in the top 50 biggest cities that shows no disproportionality in uh, African-Americans um, that have been uh, killed in police involvement. At the bottom three are Mesa, Fresno, California, and Wichita. And that's something that I think is a result of our efforts with our community and our de-escalation efforts. Um, but we don't want to throw, we don't want to kick all the cops to the curb because we've got a lot of good police officers that are compassionate and really care and go to the lengths that we all would like to see. And we want to encourage good people to come in. And my biggest worry right now is that when any of you call 911, you want the best and brightest to show up at your door that you know has the tenets of good policing, compassion, caring, you know, um, good common sense, right? But my worry is, is that if we do not come together and say, hey, we recognize we need police and we want the very best, that we encourage good people to get into policing. We may lose good people and we may not get good people applying, which will be counterproductive to what we're all trying to get to. So it is important that we do recognize that there are good police and that we need good people to enter this profession. They need to be encouraged by our communities so that we have good applicant numbers and we get the best and brightest. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Chief. I'm going to go to this the chat because there's a great question here, and this would probably go to the Chief, uh, but please address how to curb the power of police unions to stand by their members no matter what crimes they may have committed. Also, can you discuss the white supremacists that are in our departments in military? Does the WPD give privilege to military experience in hiring? Uh, so mil military, you got to keep in mind, we are trying to diversify our department and a disproportionate number of people of color go into the military. So, um, we recruit a lot of people from the military and I think that that's, I don't think that's a bad thing, right? That's people that go into military want to do service. Now, the issue is, is how do you operate your police department? Do you operate? militaristic and no we do not operate militaristic here and we're doing 
more and more to get away from old models that had that militaristic model, such as the academy, right? You know, you look at, I remember there was one academy where they wouldn't let women brush their teeth for the first week and they couldn't figure out why they're, now this wasn't here, they couldn't figure out at this agency why their washout rate for women was so high. Well, that's one reason, right? So those are the things that we need to look at. But, um, and nor do I think that we should ever discriminate against someone who's been in the military uh, for entering police work. Yeah, I, I agree. I do agree too that, you know, we've been talking about trying to move away from the paramilitary model for a long, long time. Even some of our, um, you know, some of our great reformers, uh, Orlando Wilson, O.W. Wilson, even wrote about that in the 70s, revisiting the idea of how a police department might look and, and uh, you know, coming up with various line levels for officers and management levels as opposed to calling them by rank. So uh, I think that is uh, something that, uh, again, we need to really begin to move. And you're, and you're right. Um, some of my work with training, you know, uh, research with training, some departments are literally, I mean, they're paramilitaristic. You go, it's like basic training. It's a close order drill, marching every morning, inspections. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. I have some experiences early in my career as well when I came in and it was another time. And uh, it was uh, not probably the best way to um, train as I was coming up through my agency, but we'll just leave it at that. Um, let me uh, move on. Let me see if there, there was another. Oh, this is a good, a good comment here. And I think we've addressed this, but just I just want to raise this, this comment. Most killings by the police have been done by officers with all kinds of trainings like diversity, implicit bias, de-escalation. The issue is that we need to address ideology and assess them during the hiring process. How many officers have on the force that supports ideologies of hate and exclusion? And I know that's something, you know, uh, uh, public, I don't think, realizes the types of screening or the amount of screening that an officer goes through, polygraphs, the backgrounds, the psychological workups, the medical workups. It's extensive. The problem with that is we know what an officer is like when they set the first step in the academy on the first day. They've had a fairly decent profile worked up on an, an exhaustive profile. The problem is, is when they get into the police service after two years, after three years, after five years, we know, and there's a lot of research that tells us that officers begin to change in personality over the course of their careers. And much of that is related to what they're exposed to in the field. And this goes back again, I think, to some of the uh, procedural justice models that talk about wellness inside of the organization as well, not necessarily uh, we, we know we have to use those models when we treat, when we deal with citizens, but also we have those models internally within the police agency as well of how supervisors deal with their subordinates and how managers deal with their supervisors, et cetera. So I think that that goes to say that, you know, at the front end level, we know an awful lot about those recruits when they go into the academy. It's over the course of time that we really need to keep track of what happens to them behaviorally over the course of time. And Chief, I don't know if you wanted to jump on that one as well. We do. Officer wellness is something that we're really focused on because police do see and deal with terrible, terrible things that no human being should ever see. And that constant, uh, you know, seeing these terrible things does have an impact on officers. So we're focused more on wellness and encourage our officers. Uh, we don't mandate it. We're considering it but where they do a psychological check-in once a year with counselors. Uh, and many officers take us up on that. And I think that as we move forward, that also will be a model to make sure that they are in the right frame of mind uh, when they're out dealing with people, because it is, it is a very difficult job and uh, very stressful. Um, and we need to take care of their mental health and make sure they're in a good place when they're out there dealing with our community. Absolutely. I didn't hear, excuse me, I didn't hear a response to the, I, I think there was a question about the, about the Fraternal Order of Police and the power that they, uh, that they, and the control that they actually have on police departments. It's certainly a barrier to our uh, reform efforts in Kansas City, and there's been a lot of uh, written on a national level about uh, the uh, barriers uh, that have been, you know, have been very effective on the part of, of, uh, of the bargaining units 
to pretty much resist and uh, obstruct uh, these policy reforms. I mean, is that not the case in Wichita? But I certainly think it's something that needs to be, you know, addressed because we, uh, it's a major barrier to, to reform uh, in policing across the country. I could say a lot of it depends on your arbitration systems. Uh, having worked in Minnesota, I, there is no doubt the arbitration system in Minnesota, which is arbitrators rule overwhelmingly to support uh, or to deny terminations. And if up in Minnesota, it's binding arbitration. That is that there's no override by any other entity. In Wichita, we have non-binding arbitration, which allows the city manager to overrule an arbitrator if, uh, if they disagree. Uh, that gives us a little more flexibility in dealing with, uh, you know, setting the tone and culture. Whereas in Minnesota, that, that binding arbitration, no doubt in my mind, is part of what has led to the culture issues up there. Right. Just uh, going back to the comment board, um, a participant made a comment, the FBI has been studying the prevalence of white supremacist groups inside the military, and the studies have found that it's a prevalent threat. I've actually reviewed some of those uh, studies myself. And this participant asked, how do we filter those ideological profiles during hiring? And Chief, Chief, Chief correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the background investigators do a pretty doggone good job of, of identifying those because they go to everyone that person has known for a long, long time. It, yeah, and backgrounds, we do, you know, we really dedicate a lot of resources to turning over every stone for candidates. We check with neighbors, we check with ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends, uh, employers, and on and on and ask who would say something bad about this candidate and find those people. Um, so we, that are, those are obviously concerns for us as well. Um, it's also addressed in the psychological. It, it's a full day of psychological testing that really looks for any behaviors that are extremists, uh, anything that stands out, and it is based on you know significant research and models that help us uh, ensure that we're getting the best candidates. We invest in our employees when a new officer hits the street between the background, uh, the psychological, and the training about sixty to seventy thousand dollars for every new police employee. Very good, excellent. Well, I think we are just about out of time, and I just want to take this moment uh, to acknowledge. Um, Gwen Grant and Chief Gordon Ramsey. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I've served on panels with both of you in the past and uh, I always enjoy it. I always learn something from it. And I hope the participants today, I would like to thank each one of you for attending. And I hope that you took away at least some learning points uh, today from our conversation. We could go on with this for a, a long, long time. And there's a lot of areas that we didn't cover, but we only have an hour. So I'll turn it back over to um, Megan.